With the public mood in Israel relatively better as coronavirus restrictions and deaths seemingly a thing of the past, civilians in the country's south found themselves again dealing with an old friend, rockets being fired from the Gaza Strip, sending them to bomb shelters over the weekend. Meanwhile, several days after a missile from Syria landed near Dimona, an Iranian vessel was hit in an apparent drone strike not far from the coast of Israel's northern neighbor, although since then both Iranians and Syrians are calling it an accident. With us to understand what may lay ahead is Brigadier General in Reserves Yossi Kuperwasser, former Director General of the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs. Today he is a Senior Project Manager at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. Among his senior military positions, General Kuperwasser served as Assistant Defense Attaché for Intelligence at the Israeli Embassy in Washington, D.C., and was the Intelligence Officer of the IDF Central Command and Head of Analysis and Production Division of the IDF Directorate of Military Intelligence. Mr. Kupavasser, thank you very much for joining us at such short notice. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to be brief in my uh, opening remarks to leave uh, enough time for questions. So, this is a journalist. Go ahead. Uh, uh, so, we are witnessing right now uh, growing tension on uh, two major fronts uh, that uh, Israel is involved in. One is the Palestinian front, both in the Jerusalem area and beyond in the Judea and Samaria, and in Gaza, of course, uh, with the rockets and all of that. I'll refer to it in a second. And the other is the tension around the negotiations between uh, the United States and Iran uh, through the mediation of the European Union and uh, Russia and China. Uh, to uh, overcome the differences they have over how to return to the uh, JCPOA. And uh, all of that uh, really is a real challenge for, for Israel's security community here. And uh, let's see what, what is happening and what are the, the ways of handling those challenges. So first of all, the Palestinian issue. Uh, we are in the midst of Ramadan and uh, the holy month for the Muslims. Israel is, has always, and uh, this year as well, uh, allowed uh, the uh, Muslim prayers uh, to be held in the um, Temple Mount without any uh, interference. And uh, thousands, tens of thousands of people are uh, uh, participating in those uh, prayers. Nevertheless, uh, the, the heated atmosphere uh, that was uh, especially uh, inflammatory in the night prayers, uh, the Tawrawih, uh, that are being held in the, in the Temple Mount, brought about uh, all kinds of tensions around the Temple Mount and around the old city, especially in the Nablus Gate, and uh, that, or Damascus Gate, as they call it. And, uh, and this is, uh, has caused growing tension in Jerusalem in which, uh, again and again, there were several people uh, that were hit, uh, injured uh, through the, through the uh, uh, confrontations with the police. And this eventually was used by all the Palestinian factions, including Hamas and including the Palestinian Authority as well, uh, to further uh, uh, call for action and support those youngsters, the, the youngsters of uh, Jerusalem, in their struggle against uh, the occupation and so on and so forth. And in a way of uh, showing uh, their support, uh, several groups in Gaza, probably also Hamas, we don't know for sure, uh, started launching rockets. And uh, at, uh, on Friday, uh, they actually launched something like 30 rockets, or even a little bit more, 36 rockets, towards uh, the area around the Gaza Strip. Uh, no casualties, as you know. Uh, several of them were uh, intercepted by the uh, Iron Dome, about six of them. And uh, the Israeli reaction was uh, clear uh, with uh, several attacks on uh, targets in, uh, in Gaza, uh, in, inside the Gaza Strip. And uh, the day after, I mean, last night, we had uh, a very small number of uh, attacks. And uh, there were actually there was actually no real Israeli retaliation, uh, and the, in the hope, as Prime Minister ex expressed it, that we should be able to reestablish calm uh, between us and the Palestinians. And this is going to stand to a test. It stood to some test yesterday, and it's going to stand to a test today. 
and we shall see if we can if we are able to calm down the situation. It's uh, nobody in my mind, including the Palestinians, are interested in uh, in a wide scale escalation here. Uh, but definitely, all of them take advantage of what's happening in Jerusalem in order to say how committed they are to Jerusalem. Especially it's, as it's not only Ramadan, but it's also the elections, uh, coming elections for the Palestinian Authority that are scheduled for May 22nd. And uh, everybody understands that uh, because the situation of Fatah, as we approach these elections, is so uh, difficult and so uh, weak uh, because they are divided between three lists that are competing each other against each other, the, and Hamas is uh, in one uh, list that its name is our meeting place is Jerusalem. Uh, so uh, it's clear that uh, Fatah can use, may try to use, building the, preparing the ground for using the, the Jerusalem issue as a pretext for uh, at least delaying the elections, if not canceling them altogether and uh, to avoid uh, being defeated by Hamas. And, uh, and this, of course, make, uh, makes uh, Fatah very uh, vulnerable, and Hamas takes advantage of that. So Fatah has to show that it is committed to, uh, to Jerusalem, not less than, uh, than Hamas. And Hamas has to show that they are committed to uh, Jerusalem, not less than Fatah. And uh, this has turned into some sort of a competition between Fatah and uh, Hamas about who is more committed to Jerusalem. So everybody has to show the, that they are support those youngsters uh, carrying out all kinds of uh, activities in, uh, in uh, Jerusalem. And uh, that's uh, the way they show it is a little bit different. Fatah, of course, doesn't launch rockets. But, uh, but eventually it's uh, uh, promoting violence in uh, different ways, the usual different ways that Hamas and the Fatah believe in uh, the way uh, violence should be conducted. We have the uh, Hamas calling for the use of uh, explosives and uh, firearms, and uh, this is what they do uh, with the rockets. And we have uh, Fatah calling for popular resistance, throwing uh, stones and this kind of things. This is uh, their preferred way of uh, using violence. But in the end of the day, both of them are promoting this uh, violent uh, approach towards, uh, towards Israel. And it's very difficult for each of them to uh, step back and uh, say, OK, enough is enough. So they have to find ways to say it without saying it. It's, uh, that's, uh, that's something that they are quite good at, but uh, it's still a complicated mission. And uh, that's where we stand. Of course, this was a little bit uh, uh, more complicated because some extremists uh, on the Jewish side uh, appeared on the show uh, as well on, the, on the Thursday night. And uh, this, uh, of course, made uh, the tensions more difficult to handle. Uh, but this is Jerusalem, and this is part of the of the way Israel is functioning. Anyhow, uh, this is where we stand with the Palestinians. Coming back to the elections, I mean, the uh, the challenge to Israel there is whether to uh, allow the elections to be held in Jerusalem or not. Israel has good reasons not to allow it, but uh, first of all, these elections, unlike what is stated in the Oslo agreements where in Annex 2, Israel committed itself to allow elections to be held in, uh, in Jerusalem in uh, the post offices. These elections are not for the P PA parliament. These elections are for the state of Palestine parliament. And uh, since uh, Israel doesn't uh, believe in, uh, uh, in the existence of a uh, Palestinian state, it's very difficult for Israel to allow uh, these kind of elections to be held. Uh, secondly, uh, Hamas is participating now uh, front and center in, the, in these elections. It's not uh, some sort of a game in which Hamas appears under a different name. This time it's Hamas itself and it's, uh, its list, just like other lists, is full with terrorists. And uh, in the uh, annex, annex two of uh, the Oslo agreements, Israel uh, was ready to, to allow Palestinians to participate in the elections 
if uh, if they are uh, not using illegal and violent ter- uh, means in order to promote their uh, interest, their ideas. Okay, so this time you cannot say that this is the case because uh, uh, you have on the on the list of many of the list uh, people who are terrorists uh, that were convicted terrorists or uh, close relatives for the, of terrorists that uh, are there because of their close relations with terrorists. And uh, so uh, these are uh, good reasons. And the third reason is that Palestinians say that they want to hold the elections in Jerusalem because they consider that a part of the area under their responsibility and the part of their state. And of course, Israel cannot, uh, not only that Israel opposes the idea that there is such a state, but it definitely doesn't agree that uh, the, these parts of Jerusalem are uh, part of that uh, alleged state. So the Palestinians built it in a way that is impossible for Israel to accept. And so never, nevertheless, Israel has not said no yes yet, but uh, it's obvious that Israel cannot say yes. And uh, so the Palestinians know that, and this is of course was built as a, as a, right from the beginning as a tool with which if they wish to, they can cancel the elections because the Palestinians say, we're not going to hold elections if they are not hold, held everywhere, including in Jerusalem. So it's, uh, or at least some of them say so. Many, but not all. And, uh, uh, General, we just, uh, there are a few questions that are coming in. We also want to get to the other okay. front. Uh, so so front one word about the other front, okay? Uh, the other front is, uh, as I said, the uh, Iran issue. Uh, Israel is very unhappy uh, or Israeli government is very unhappy with the idea that uh, everybody goes back to the JCPOA, to the 2015 uh, Iran nuclear agreement. First of all, because the problem with this agreement is that it leads to uh, the capability of the Iranians to uh, produce a big arsenal of nuclear weapons in 10 years from now. Secondly, because the Iranians never fulfilled their commitments and uh, there's no way to go back to the agreement uh, the way it was, because the Iranians have already enriched uranium to 60%. The Iranians have already produced uranium metal. The Iranians have already used advanced centrifuges like the IR6, IR4, and IR24, uh, 2M. So it's, uh, it's, it's, there's no way to go back to the agreement. And uh, it's, it's a different thing. And Israel believes that what we need is a totally different agreement. So this is what uh, this delegation is going to discuss in, uh, in Washington in the coming uh, days. And in the meanwhile, Israel continues to do what, what it believes it's necessary in order to uh, prevent Iran from dominating the region and from um, going forward to having a nuclear capability. And uh, the most important thing in this respect is, is uh, taking care of the uh, presence of the Iranians in Syria and, and the, the deliveries of weapons to Syria and to Hezbollah. In the context of this uh, effort, Israel took some uh, measures, kinetic measures in, uh, on uh, Thursday night. And uh, what happened was that uh, the uh, rockets, the anti-aircraft uh, missiles that were used by, uh, by the Syrian air defense, one of them, the SA-5, uh, ended up uh, exploding in the northern Negev, uh, not far from Dimona, and uh, but this was not in any way uh, some sort of an Iranian uh, intentional effort to hit Dimona. Some people presented it; it, uh, it was something totally different. It happened. We we were targeted by SA-5 several times during the uh, attacks on uh, Iranian targets in uh, in Syria, and. Uh, in one case, even uh, one of our planes was intercepted. Uh, so this is nothing new. And uh, I think this effort will keep uh, going because it's critical and essential for Israel to make sure that uh, Iran doesn't have the capability to hit Israel severely from Syrian territory or that Hezbollah gets uh, uh, what he wants, uh, which is to get a much better precise munition uh, in Lebanon. This is something that we are trying to prevent. This is it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, General Cooper, Master. Uh, a few questions that are coming in on both fronts. We'll start with the Palestinian because we began the, the briefing that way as well. Uh, you mentioned that Israel is being quite contained in its response thus far. 
what kind of event uh, or incident would uh, would change things on the ground and cause Israel to retaliate um, harshly? Yeah, of course. Uh, after this meeting yesterday, the Israeli leadership made it clear that uh, if this uh, overture of Israel to calm down the situation is not going to be responded by Hamas, and we shall see more rockets falling over Israel. And uh, of course, I would say that uh, the numbers do may, do matter, and uh, the targets, the kind of targets, do matter as well. Uh, but uh, but if we see more rockets and uh, more attacks, Israel may uh, try to hit uh, Hamas harsher. And uh, it's not there's no problem of uh, availability of targets in in Gaza. So it's uh, I think that uh, they know that. And uh, what's more important in this respect is that uh, what Israel said was that uh, if this is going to be the case. Uh, the leadership of Hamas knows what is uh, going to happen, uh, hinting at the possibility of hitting the Hamas leadership itself. So uh, I think this is something that the Hamas is very concerned about. And we did see last night uh, much lesser activity uh, on behalf of uh, the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. I'm not sure if it was Hamas that launched the, the few the two rockets that were launched from there. One of them fell inside the, the Gaza Strip, one of them was intercepted. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, if this was Hamas, but uh, definitely Hamas is trying to to uh, reevaluate its uh, reassess its position on, on what's going on. And there was a little bit less activity in Jerusalem as well, so this can also explain why there was less necessity from Hamas uh, to to do something. Uh, and uh, but if if we fail with our effort to calm down the situation, there is the possibility that we shall hit hard. I mean, uh, this is clear to everybody involved, and I think that uh, Egyptians are also delivering this message uh, to the to the Hamas uh, leadership in Gaza, and uh, I believe that Abu Mazen reads that as well. Uh, although uh, when I read the, the Palestinian papers, I see less uh, readiness on, on Abu Mazen's side to count down uh, his uh, messages. You mentioned uh, Palestinian newspapers, but uh, some people are calling this the, the TikTok intifada, which means that what is actually inciting the younger people to violence is the use of social media platforms. Uh, but the, the use of the word intifada itself, do you think this is going overboard? Are we headed that way at all? No, I, I don't, I, you know, there's, uh, we are using the term intifada too, too easily in my mind. Uh, there's a uh, there's an unrest. Uh, there's a, the situation is uh, very tense, but I wouldn't call it yet intifada. It's uh, it's uh, for the time being. It's mostly in, in certain locations, especially in Jerusalem. It's less violent than what we were experiencing in the in the intifada. Uh, we have to take care of every violent uh, event, but uh, it's it's not uh, that. It's not the magnitude of an intifada, and the Palestinians are still under the impression that they don't want to have a, another intifada. It's too costly for them. Uh, in their national memory, the intifada is a so, sort of a disaster. Of course, they cannot say it, but they, this is the way they refer to it. And, uh, so I don't think we are witnessing a third intifada. Uh, we, we are seeing, uh, we have been through uh, such rounds, uh, even worse than that, uh, throughout the years since the second intifada. Uh, we had the, uh, in the end of 2014 and uh, in the end of 2015 and the beginning of 2016, the Knives Intifada. And, uh, and as always, this, is how, uh, this begins and uh, deals primarily with Jerusalem. Al-Aqsa, uh, Al-Aqsa, this libel that Israel is trying to uh, cause any harm to, to the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the, to the Temple Mount, uh, and, uh, change the conditions over there and all kinds of things that, uh, that these messages are coming from various sources inside the Palestinian community, including from the Palestinian Authority leadership. This is terrible, this is irresponsible, and uh, it's a pity that this is the case, but uh, the fact is that Israel changed nothing. And, uh, and yes, the, the social media is, is uh, you mentioned, is one of the uh, channels through which uh, incitement uh, is being uh, promoted. Uh, the TikTok uh, events had the contribution to this, but it's not. Uh, it's it's beyond that. It's the it's coming from the leadership. 
the leadership could have uh, ignored that and uh, or tried to put a cap off of that. Uh, what they did was just the opposite, and they actually promoted it. And that's uh, once this was the case, uh, we see what we what we see today. We call so, for example. Uh, tonight in the uh, Temple Mount, uh, preachers calling for uh, people to uh, become shaheeds and things like that. This is uh, this is extremely dangerous, and uh, the Palestinian Authority, more than anybody else, uh, and Hamas as well, has, uh, has to show responsibility and uh, make sure that this doesn't uh, go beyond control. Our One journalist is asking uh, whether the the coronavirus situation in the Gaza Strip uh, is going to impact Hamas's decision making, uh, whether it's in the context of moving the conversation over to to Israel or or will it impact the elections in any way? But whether whether the the pandemic is playing a part here, I think the role of the pandemic is very limited. It's uh, yes, the, the situation in Gaza is not uh, extremely good. But it has improved in the in the last couple of days. It was much worse in the uh, previous week. Uh, but uh, regardless of what is the situation with the with the corona, what is uh, more uh, uh, what has more influence on what's uh, going on is the is the national uh, and the, the national goals that uh, the way the Hamas see it. And uh, the inter-Palestinian relations, the way the Hamas see it, that these are the things that uh, determine the way the Hamas operates. Uh, the Corona situation is, is, is a marginal uh, consideration. Very clear. Okay, in the time we have left, let's uh, let's uh, ask some questions uh, that are being sent in about the Iranian issue. Uh, you mentioned the Israeli delegation headed by the chief of the Mossad that is going to go to Washington today to try to to speak to the Biden administration about the nuclear deal, the imminent return of the US to the nuclear deal. Uh, generally, you've worked with the Americans in several capacities over the years. Uh, what are the next steps the administration will take and, and will Israel's calls fall on deaf ears? Well, these are not deaf ears, of course. It's, uh, the fact that they, they avail themselves to uh, listening to, to, to the Israelis, it's, they are not deaf. But uh, unfortunately, the, the direction we have seen with the American administration until now is, uh, is problematic from an Israeli point of view. It's, uh, I mean, in the beginning, uh, the, the administration was saying that, uh, okay, he, they want to go back to the Iran deal, but first of all, uh, they have to make sure that Iran has uh, uh, retreated from all the breaches of the agreement uh, it carried uh, in the last couple of uh, years, and uh, that uh, uh, only then the, the sanctions will be lifted. I, I think and Israel thinks that this is a mistake because how? Can, and and then the, the, the administration said we shall begin negotiating with the Iranians together with our allies in the in the region, uh, and uh, of course the EU three and the Russia and China a better deal that will take care of some of the flows of the current deal. This was the, the original position. Uh, what we see now is that uh, they speak much less about the longer and stronger and wider uh, agreement that uh, was supposed to be reached in the second phase. The second phase has been given much less uh, attention. And uh, they are not at all uh, at the same position about, about the sequence. Now all they want to, to, to have is some guarantees. They want to be uh, convinced that uh, Iran is going to uh, retreat from its uh, breaches of the agreement before they lift the sanctions. Not that the Iranians will actually uh, retreat from, the, from their breaches, but just give some sort of a reason to, to uh, feel that uh, you can trust them, that they will do that. This is ridiculous in my mind, uh, and, uh, because we know that we, we know the Iranians. I mean, I, I refer everybody to the uh, interview of uh, the head of the Iranian Atomic Energy Agency, uh, Mr. Salehi, uh, who uh, told the Iranian TV very proudly how they cheated the IAEA uh, inspectors and the uh, other members of the uh, of the agreement, and instead of filling the Calendria of the uh, Arak uh, nuclear reactor with cement. They used Photoshop in order to show that they did what well, they actually didn't. 
and filled all kinds of uh, pipes that were supposed to be filled with cement while buying uh, other pipes to replace them. And actually they cheated and he was so happy in telling the, the uh, Iranian television how, he, how they cheated the, the, everybody. This is the kind of people you are, you are going to trust that they will uh, undo their breaches of the agreement. It's, uh, I mean, how naive can you be? It's, uh, so it's, uh, the, this is a real source of concern. And beyond of that, even if the Iranians and the Iranians might go back to the, uh, to the JCPOA because there's nothing better for Iran than the JCPOA. They don't have to breach any, any article in the JCPOA. The JCPOA guarantees the, the Iranians a safe path to having a, the capability to produce a large uh, arsenal of nuclear weapons in 10 years. All the alternatives that they are using now, all this brinkmanship that they are doing now, is supposed to give them one bomb, that, but they have to, in order to have it, they have to cross a certain threshold that is extremely dangerous because inside the, this, this uh, threshold, they are going to be exposed to harsh economic sanctions and maybe also exposed to some sort of a military activity against them. So it's uh, obviously the Iranians believe that if they manage to go back to the to the agreement, it would be great. And the situation right now is that the negotiations are framed to, in, in a way that the mainstream discussion is what kind of sanctions the Iranians, the Americans have to lift before the Iranians even think about going back to the agreement. Is it, uh, you know, the, those the three kinds of uh, sanctions uh, that, uh, that the, the Americans are talking about. Uh, so this is this is where this is where we stand. This is going to be an interesting uh, discussion about that in in Washington between uh, the chief of Mossad and uh, the head of the uh, National Security Council uh, and, uh, and their counterparts in 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 the in the states. It's, uh, I I mean the Americans know all, everything that I'm saying now. The Americans know, so it's uh, there's no surprise here. And the, the fact that they are moving in this direction, in spite of the fact that they know all of that, is, uh, is a source of concern for Israel, I guess. Thank you, General. One question uh, that has popped up a few from a few different journalists was concerning the timeline of production of the bomb, uh, which changes every now and then. What is the current assessment of uh, Iran's uh, nuclear capabilities? How far are they away if they choose, irregardless of the, uh, the agreement? So, well, that's a very good question, because uh, what we know is that, that today the Iranians are about a couple of months away from having enough, if they decide to uh, start a rush towards having a nuclear weapon, uh, they are a couple of months away of having enough fissile material uh, for uh, producing a first nuclear bomb. On top of that, you have to take the time that is needed in order to take this fissile material and turn it into a bomb. This may last uh, more than a year, maybe close to two years, uh, before they are able to do that. But we have to remember that we don't know everything. It's, uh, when we looked at the, the Iranian nuclear archives, uh, we learned all kinds of things that we didn't know before. All the activities that they were carrying out in Parachin, the uh, additional uh, sites that uh, were in Tukuzabad and in Abade and other places. Uh, not all of that was known and uh, the, the activities that were carried out over there were not uh, as, as uh, uh, public as they are today, far from that. Some of them were not at all declared to the IAEA. And uh, the IAEA just recently found in some of these places uh, anthropogenic uh, uranium particles. So it's, uh, we have to be modest in our assessment and uh, take into account the possibility that the Iranians made some more progress in the weaponization stage than what we know, so that the, that stage of weaponization may be shorter than what we would assess that it should be. So uh, that's my assessment about uh, timetables. Uh, one thing is clear. All these uh, nuclear activities that the Iranians are doing have no civilian justification. I mean, this is uh, all of that has, has no civilian justification. They don't need all this enrichment of, uh, activity for civilian purposes. Everybody is ready to give them any kind, any amount of uh, uranium, low, uh, low level enriched uranium for their uh, scientific activities and uh, civilian necessities. 
there's no such uh, problem. So everything they are doing now is in the context of the military nuclear project. And the fact that they, they even operate uh, the, the nuclear uh, enrichment facility in Fordu, built deep into a mountain, and uh, it's a very small facility, uh, built only for, new, for military purposes, is, uh, is really disturbing because, uh, and this is one of the major flaws of the, of the JCPOA. The fact that this facility was not dismantled is really beyond my, my understanding. It's only for military purposes. And uh, that's, uh, these are the things that uh, are of concern because who knows, maybe they have another location where they can make progress without anybody knowing about it. I understand. I know that I promised to let you go by 12 o'clock, but we just have, if you, if you allow it, two more questions that yeah, are, two more questions. have okay. come in. Uh, one that really uh, uh, overlaps both worlds that we've been speaking of. Uh, it was reported that General Aviv Kuchavi uh, the IDF uh, the chief of general staff uh, postponed his his trip to to the U.S. Um, does this signify a fear that things will escalate nonetheless here on the ground in Israel? Yes, I think it does. I mean, if we were under the impression that if Israel was under the impression that uh, okay that that this round is over, I guess uh, General Kohavi would have gone to uh, to the states. If he stays here, it means that uh, the uh, security establishment here uh, assesses with high probability that uh, this is not over, and uh, there is a possibility that uh, the, that we should see further escalation, and that's why the chief of staff wants to stay here and uh, be in control of the situation. Uh, I guess this is the this is their assessment whether it's going to be. I think by doing that. Uh, the chances that uh, such an escalation will actually take place is uh, getting lower uh, because it is a clear message to, the, to Hamas that uh, we mean business and uh, if you don't behave uh, like we expect you to behave and uh, calm down the situation, uh, we are ready to take uh, severe steps. And uh, since they don't want an escalation, I mean, I think that they may read it this way and uh, it's going to help them reach the conclusion that uh, they should uh, uh, calm down. But uh, is it going to be enough by itself to, to make sure that this is going to be the case? I'm, I'm not sure. We shall see how things happen in Jerusalem and uh, how they affect. And uh, also we shall see what's happening if, if Abu Mazen decides, as uh, many people believe, uh, to uh, postpone the elections. That's, uh, if, he, if he decides to do that, uh, then uh, the, the high, uh, there's a high probability that we shall see some sort of tensions inside the Palestinian uh, uh, community and, uh, and also between us and the, and, and the Palestinians, uh, we shall see some efforts to blame Israel and to take action against Israel for, for something like that. But this is going to be problematic. Understood. And just our final question that's been uh, sent. Oh, there are actually a few more questions, but I will respect <laughs> everybody's time and we'll end with uh, one more. Uh, who is likely to succeed uh, Abu Mazen? The question of all questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think even Abu Mazen doesn't know. Uh, uh, there's a big uh, quarrel between the diadox. Uh, uh, everybody believes that he has the best chance. I personally think that uh, the security forces of the uh, Palestinian Authority are still in a better uh, starting point and uh, their uh, opponents in trying to take uh, control of the uh, PA uh, controlled areas. If something happens to uh, Abu Mazen, I wish him uh, long, uh, long life and uh, good health. Uh, but uh, if something happens to him and uh, he's 86 years old, uh, then uh, I think uh, people like Majid Faraj and, uh, and other members of the PA uh, establishment are better positioned to take uh, uh, control of the situation. They are going to be challenged by, uh, by Dahlan, they are going to be challenged by Baruti, they are going to be, I don't know where exactly they stand uh, with uh, regards to uh, Jibril Rajoub, who is also competing for the for the position. Of course, Hamas is also going to look at uh, this as an opportunity. So if, uh, if Abu Mazen leaves all of a sudden, uh, the, there's no clear uh, air and uh, we are going to see uh, 
very problematic uh, competition that can be also be violent uh, between the different factions inside Fatah and outside. Very clear. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have time to reach all of the questions, uh, but uh, I will. I'm happy to connect uh, the journalist directly to you, uh, Brigadier General in reserves, Yossi Kupel Vassil, if you, if you uh, agree. No uh, problem, yeah. Thank right. you again for your time. Thank you to the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs for lending us uh, you and have a good day to everybody. Thank you, thank you all. We hope you enjoyed that briefing by the Jerusalem Press Club. If you did, like the video and hit the subscribe button to stay up to date with all of our future content.